Hello and welcome my partners in crime and you know I always say it in the nicest possible way. Okay so this is the second, third case actually out this week. This is um, quite a very sad case to tell you the truth. A little bit different, it is about some, well not even domestic abuse, about coercive behaviour, it's about relationships and it's about not a very long term relationship either but it's about how disturbed someone can be when you break up with them what can happen really and when there is not really real signs of this happening there are there were signs i think in this case of coercive behavior okay um she felt like she was being smothered by this person i think the relationship only lasted about seven or eight months and stuff until we ended up killing her and also other people um so I think this case is a little bit different from the last two, from Charlotte's and uh, Christie's case, but not really. We're still coming down, doesn't it, to a relationship between a man and a woman that's gone wrong. And where the person thinks, and it's about what he said, that made you think, if he couldn't have her, no one else will. So anyway, Ashley Martin, 32, this, he was devastated actually, this man, right? because his first ever girlfriend was Jay Edmonds, who was 27 years old at the time. Now, she ended that relationship. As I said, she ended it because she felt that he was smothering her. They'd been away for Christmas and that, and she really couldn't handle him. I think by that stage, she had even thought, hang on, I can't take no more. A little bit like Charlotte, weren't having none of it. You know, I'm moving on. So she finished the relationship on December the 28th, uh, 2018. Um, and as I said, she was telling people sort of her character had changed a little bit and also she was saying she had been smothered by him. She just couldn't live her life. He wouldn't allow her. He was too intense on what he'd done. He wanted to control her and she wasn't having any of it. So anyway, anyway um, listen, I'm going to tell you about how he became prepared for this murder. So this again was a premeditated murder. Premeditated. So detectives have wrote that um, Mr. Martin had hired a Ford Transit van, brought a murder kit consisting of bear grills, lock knife and, um, and hunting knife, a 20 litre jerry can, which is the petrol can, binoculars, waterproof matches, strong fishing line, a camping stove, a gas torch, batteries and waterproof matches on New Year's Eve. Now, you think, <laughs> okay, what's he going to do with all this stuff? You know, this is his killing kit. So what was on in his mind? I don't know whether he went there. I think he did go to kill without doubt. Okay, he went to kill. There was, and I'll tell you why I think that his plans may have changed, because I think this may have been an abduction and then a murder, if there was something not happening that he didn't know about in this home. I think with him, there was, uh, so it triggered the murder there and then in this home. But this, I just wanted to explain to you that this was premeditated, this was planned. We've said this about Christie's, um, you know, that Alex Staines, he was pre-prepared, wasn't he? This was premeditated. You take a knife to a scene, you've set your affairs in order, you're getting ready now to kill. This one was the same. He was getting ready for the kill and he had an array of equipment to use in any circumstances, it seems, here, to take this girl knife. So I think this, this whole array of stuff, this, this, murder kit if you'd like to call it and he had purchased this all this stuff and it was 253 pounds from an outdoor store in peterborough in cambridgeshire despite having a diesel van right so why would he buy petrol he brought 17 liters of petrol put it in this jerry can from the shell garage less than half a mile away from her property but he had a diesel van so now we know don't we there's arson here there's something going on here because no one puts 17 litres of petrol when you drive a diesel car. You just don't do it. So um, I think 
Jay Edmonds. Now, Jay, she was, she had returned home, I think, about 2.30 in the morning. Again, they've been out, you know, it's New Year's, on New Year's Day, they've been out New Year's Eve. The lot, isn't it, going on here on New Year's Eve? So they'd returned home, and now um, Mr. Hicks, who was 24, now, he was also murdered at this property. And he's the one, I think, that really triggered something even worse here, because I don't think that um, he knew about him at all. I think when he was going to this girl's house, to Jay's house, he only expected to find her there. He did not expect to find Mr. Hicks there. He's only 24 years old. And he had also been in a previous relationship with her for actually quite a long time before, and they broke up. And then in the breakup, she had met her killer, really. And that was his first girlfriend. And as I think it started, lasted seven or eight months. Then she got rid of him and went straight back then to Hicks. And it's, um, it's very sad. All this family is very sad. Anyway, Mr. Hicks was stabbed in the heart during the struggle. Now, what happens is he turns up well equipped to this property, right? Uh, well equipped, and that was in Lancashire. So he's drove, I think, from Dunstable to Lancashire because he lived in Hertfordshire, Dunst Dunstable, Bedfordshire, isn't it? Bedfordshire, uh, in, in Dunstable and Bedfordshire, and drove to Lancashire where um, Jay had moved. After she'd finished with him, she had moved them back. Now, the home did belong to her parents. Um, it wasn't her parents' only home. It was her parents that rented this home out. And she had always kept her room rented or left there for her to live in. And it was also then rented out to other people. And this is why this case now is, is it, it gets up, because a lot more people could have died here in this arson attack. And uh, he would have known that also, that there are other people in this house. Well, he did know that people were in this house. So what's happened was when um, she'd gone then to this house, she'd got, you know, it's New Year's Eve, they're out and about, they're drinking, they've gone out, and her and Higgs had um, gone back then to the house and had a little chat with them, with their roommates and flatmates and housemates, and then gone to bed. Now what they didn't know was that um, he was outside watching. And when all the lights went out, um, he, they, they had a cat and they'd left a downstairs window open ajar for the cat to come in and out of and he got in through that window. Um, the next thing, uh, you have a couple of the girls that live in the house woke up to this terrible fighting and screaming and everything else and I think this is what's happened when he's turned up in that bedroom, he's got to that bedroom and he saw not only Jay there, but Mr. Hicks there, and uh, this young 24 year old lad, and he stabbed him through the heart. He killed him straight away. Then he'd locked the bedroom door with his jerry can, and they could smell petrol now, the other people in this house. They heard Jay screaming, you know, stop hitting me, don't do that, stop hitting me. Um, I think one of the young girls was screaming and shouting and kicking the door in of the bedroom to get to her. And because she thought it may have been a row between them two, she didn't realise there was some other perpetrator in the home at that point. As she's tried to kick this door in, uh, the door opened and he's standing there with a knife. And then she knew something was wrong. And by this stage now, the house is now on fire. He's actually now set the house on fire as well. So then you have all these people in this house trying to come out. <laughs> you know, she can't get out. Jay's now, you've got Mr Hicks now murdered on the bed. He's then set fire to the bedroom. We know now that he's hitting and beating um, Jay and where she's rendered probably unconscious or whatever, but they all died. All three of them died in that home from smoke inhalation. I think how the neighbours and how people have described this fire, because when you're talking about 17 litres of petrol, especially put in one area, the, the fire was so intense that the bedroom floor literally collapsed in the house. There was also like a fireball explosion that blew most of the windows out in the home. Uh, I think 
the three bodies were so badly burnt, all three of them could only be um, identified by their um, teeth, really. That was it, by the dental records. That's all they, that was left of them. So the post-mortem concluded that they all died from smoke inhalation. Why contributory factors of the death of Mr. Hicks was a life-threatening wound to the heart. So he had been stabbed anyway. Now, this is what I think about with when he was planning this murder. He didn't know about Mr. Hicks at that point. He didn't know. He'd been looking through um, pub windows and different things. We'd known he'd been doing that and he'd been stalking her a little bit. They'd only been split up four days. Four days. So it's not very long, is it? But he was hunting for her. He was looking for her, looking for something. He couldn't find her. And that's why he broke into that house. And I think when he saw Mr. Hicks there, that was then the trigger. I think he was already going to murder her. Of course he was. He'd come prepared and he'd come equipped to do a variety of things. I think, I think, I didn't, don't think he would have killed her there and then. I don't know if the fire would have been started there and then. You know, this man come equipped with camping equipment with everything else. I don't know if he was going to, or if he was going to kill her, then go off camping and, you know, live outdoors because he put his bare grills or something. Um, but, um, there's, you know, there's a lot, but he didn't actually know about Mr. Hicks until he entered that room that night, got through that winter, entered that room, immediately really killed him, and then really that was it, that was on, and um, that house literally was destroyed. The other two girls that lived in that house um, got out, they had to fight to get out, the neighbours helped them get out. Uh, they couldn't save her, they tried, but when you um, open a door and there's a man there with a knife, a very big knife, who's enraged, and um, there's also now a fire going on behind him. He was definitely going to take his own life that night. I think he knew that from the minute this case started, from the minute he had in his mind that he was going to kill Jay Edmonds. That was it. He knew he was going to take his own life. So it's a murder-suicide, really, this one. But he'd only known her eight months. Eight months. She'd only been split up within four days. Absolutely terrible, isn't it, when you think? She had left Dunstable, because she met him, I think, while working with him. It was his first girlfriend. I think his brother says he used to do outdoor pursuits and different things like this. He loved that sort of lifestyle. Um, I think with this case, it's a devastating case, isn't it, really? Because there's so many innocent parties. All of these people are innocent. And there's no justice, is there? Because he's killed himself. The family have got no redress, really. He's killed himself. Uh, I mean, what would he have got? 20 years, if you're lucky. I think the way that he done it, the premeditation of it, makes him a serious predator, really. Because when there's premeditation, out goes the window, really, doesn't it, of someone that's mentally ill. Yes, this man um, was infatuated with her, it was his first girlfriend, but many men, I think his, I think his brother says he's actually, his first sexual relationship was with a prostitute, actually, from Amsterdam when he was about 28. All right, so he's a late bloomer. And then, of course, after that, he meets Jay, and that's his first real relationship. But he didn't know how to treat her in that relationship. He treated her like a possession, like she was his. And you see, most people won't tolerate that, will they? So after eight months of it, really, she'd had enough. And I think spending Christmas with him was enough to show her that this is never going to work. And that's why she ended up leaving him. Now, his brother states that um, she was never good enough for his brother. Really? And you think, well, you know, you, he could have killed himself. That's his right, isn't it? He could have killed himself if he couldn't cope with the loss. He could have killed himself. He could have sought help for that, you know, if he was having suicidal thoughts. But when your suicidal thoughts turn to taking out other people as part of that, that's when you become a killer, a murderer. And you deserve no respect at all. 
I'd have had more respect for the man if he'd gone, sought help, anything, you know, and then killed himself. But when you take people's lives, when you've only been in their life for eight months, you know, and then you've only been split up four days. And, and as I said, he didn't know that she was with Mr. Hicks. He didn't know, because I think if he did, it wouldn't have even been four days. So you never know, you see. You haven't got to have long-term relationships for an infatuation like this to start, because that's what it is. And sometimes, with these sort of mindsets of these predators, you have to be so careful. And I always say, there's no one answer to what you should do if you are in a domestic violence situation, if you are being controlled coercively, right? There's no certain way of doing it. You can't, one case doesn't fit all. Because people are different. We've had three cases here, three cases. Two of these people were in relationships with somebody else at the time that they murdered their victims. Not even long term. I think the longest one we've had in these three cases is Christy, who left her partner in 2018. But she was very young when she met him. But she had the guts and the going to, to leave him in 2018. And she died last year, or this year. So we have to think every case is different, isn't it? Every perpetrator is different. So if you are experiencing, I keep saying this, you know, if you're experiencing um, any form of abuse like that or control, you need to seek help. You need to seek it because there's no one answer here. I'm not going to tell you just to get up and leave. It's more difficult. It's more easy for me to say it. It's not easy to be done. It's really not. Sometimes it can be quite dangerous, can't it? But what annoys me when I do all these cases is where we've had since this time of these cases new laws in place. And all right, with Jay's case, it was very quick. There was no um, police called or no record of it. With the other two, there was. And especially with Christie's, there was. There was information there already. I think he was actually, that Alex Staines was actually... Um, out on bail because of Peter. Now, you think, come on, you know? And then I actually think that he turned up, someone said he turned up at the police station and they sent him away because they didn't believe him. But then that's a worry that, you see, when you think, if he'd turned up at the police station before he'd done it, would they have took him seriously? He turned up at the police station after and they didn't, even though she had already had complaints made against him. They knew there was coercive behaviour going on. They knew she was in danger, had death threats, because they had had to call 24 hours before. Why didn't it flag up? The story that I've heard about the Sonic Stains is that um, they sent him away, didn't believe him. Why this girl they dying? So listen, I don't know what to tell you apart from Seek help. You don't have to put up with it. Change your mindset. Belong to no one. Really, belong to no one. You don't need to belong to anybody. You can have a perfect marriage, can't you? I mean, I've been married for nearly 40 years. 40 years! I mean, I could have done longer in prison than that. But I've been married for nearly 40 years. But my mindset has always been the same. Is that you are in a relationship which is a relationship that is of equal parts. It has to be both, doesn't it? If one is doing that sort of behaviour, it's not equal. Now listen, let's even talk about, and I've, 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 when I used to teach my class, I used to contract or a simple form of contract is marriage. Now even in that contract, when we look at contract, there's a thing called consideration to make that contract be formed because without consideration then there can't be. Now consideration means in law that everyone has got to be equal, right? One can't benefit without the other one benefiting. 
that is the same thing. Now, for many, many years, we've had these iconic, really old laws in marriage and relationships and, you know, all this stuff where, you know, uh, I think in the 90s it was changed, wasn't it? Where you don't say, you know, love, honour and obey, you don't say obey a bit now. Now, listen, I was married way before that. But I don't obey no one. It's about the mindset, isn't it? I could, could not think, I would feel sorry for the man that married me and thinks he's going to control me because my mindset, I couldn't do it. I'd probably end up being the one in prison, really. Really, that is how bad it is. But I was brought up, you see, in a domestic abuse home. So I am well used to it. I am used to that and I chose very early on not to allow that near myself or my children and I would never have tolerated it. But a lot of people in my situation that were brought up with domestic abuse and domestic violence understand that it's normal, don't they? Now listen, I'm not saying it hasn't messed me up, of course it has when you see these sort of things, but what it did do was make sure that I wouldn't tolerate it, ever, ever. I wouldn't tolerate it, and the mindset is different. So all I'm saying to you is getting that mindset that you belong to no one, no matter how long you've been married, how long you've been with these people, you belong to no one. Your life is yours to do what you will with. But just be careful how you get out of it. That's all I'm saying. So anyway, you know what to do. Subscribe, 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 okay? Remember, I keep saying to you, I wanna to get to this 100,000. Let's put another zero on the end of that. I'm not even gonna say 20,000. I'm just gonna go for the 100. Let's keep going. You know, smash that like button. Let's get that like button out there. I should really say this at the beginning, shouldn't I, these videos. You can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. You can catch this on podcast. There's a lot of things you can do. Don't forget what's coming up soon will be my, you know, murder mornings where I'm going to go through your comments, where I can answer your comments because I'm typing them is just there's so many. So now I'm just going to start answering a few and having little chats. If you've got any questions that you want to ask me, start typing away. You can go on the community page and leave some of that stuff on there and I'll get to as many as I can and we'll do it over the weeks. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for you know, everything you've done for Murder Analyze, we really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you sharing out these. If you don't share out any other cases or talk about any other cases that we do, these are the important ones to talk about. These are the ones that we need to make aware, people aware. Because if you are going through domestic violence now, you need to get help. There's numbers for UK on there. I've told you that I'm going to start doing these t-shirts, we belong to no one on them and we're going to find a local charity and we'll be doing that over the next few weeks where we will be starting up. But I believe in charities, if they're going to offer something, they have to offer the local community something. So if you are a local charity out there that deals with domestic abuse, violence, please contact me and we can see what we can do. So. Thanks for listening. Till the next time. Bye-bye.